And he has overcome. Hallelujah. Good morning, good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Welcome to Fun Day, which is Sunday. Hey, Lemon. It's good to be here. We just returned from our pastor's conference in, in Belize. It was a, quite a, a memorable time. I know each year I come back and I report after these conferences that, well, that was just the best one ever. And that's what they tell me each year. That was just the best one ever. I had, in fact, a couple pastors stand up and can, you know, say, this is just the best one ever. Uh, but it is the best one ever. I mean, what are you going to do? Uh, it really was a phenomenal time. Uh, and Nick Harris, Pastor Strickland, our son Joseph went with us to help facilitate a lot of the things that have to go on. So it just turned out to be a really exceptional conference. And uh, uh, Pastor Nick, you know, we got our, our marriage retreat coming with Pastor Nick here pretty soon. And uh, I'd forgotten how good Nick Harris is, you know, when it comes to family and to marriage and to what he focused on there. And and some of y'all remember hearing Brother Nick. And then I forgot how funny he was. Uh, my side literally hurts today from laughing so much as, as I did during that time. Those Belizean pastors will never be the same. So. In fact, Tim and I got a little jealous coming home. We were looking at the evaluation sheets and the, where they, you know, they'd turn in a little evaluation sheet at the end of it and talk about different things they'd like to see in the coming future topics and things and, that we do. And then, and then what were the highlights for you? And, and all, so many of them said that we could bring Brother Nick back. I'll let that soak in a moment. Didn't, didn't say bring Brother Tim back. Didn't say bring Brother Joe back. Bring Brother Nick back. So, I've repented of my jealousy, so I'm ready to preach this morning. But uh, he really did accept the job. And, and Pastor Strickland, you know, I, you know, we all know Brother Tim's a, a, a really, really good preacher. But he's even a better teacher. I mean, when it comes to the teaching aspect of that ministry. And so uh, even Joseph commented on that. Man, he really does great in this format, doesn't he? And so you did a great job and you've been proud of him. So uh, I, I, I muddled through it and we got there. Amen. So it was a great conference. But I do, I do want to say this. How many pastors came up to me and even one announced publicly their appreciation for Believers Fellowship for hosting these conferences. They know that they cost a lot of money to do. And they just tried to express the value that they get from it each and every year in, in their churches and in their ministries. Uh, the training, the, the encouragement, the insight that they get, not only for their own personal relationship and their marriage, because we deal a lot with that each conference. Every year we have that section on that. And then we do an administrative section like Tim was teaching. And then we do, you know, get out of the rut and get on fire for Jesus, my portion of it, you know. And uh, so every year it's that same, same kind of following that we do, but they just, you know, wanted. In fact, several of them specifically said, you need to tell your church that we do not take this lightly. This impacts our whole congregations in our villages and in our churches and our communities more than they'll ever know. Because what we get here, we carry out and we carry on and we train others and we disciple others. So uh, from them and multiple of them, I will say to you, thank you again. God bless you and may your tribe increase. Amen. So praise the Lord. So give yourself a praise the Lord for doing something that has such an eternal weight and value. I didn't preach last week because I was coming back from vacation and uh, I was at the Magnolia campus, but Pastor Tim did, did a great job in, in preaching to you. I, I, I was not here, but remember the Sunday before, I know y'all can't remember yesterday, much less the Sunday before. I have trouble doing it. Sometimes I ask Kathy, what did I preach last Sunday? So uh, if that's me, I know maybe it may be more difficult for you. Uh, but I did speak on what to do when, you, when your ship sinks, right? And how to handle the, those calamities of life. Really more like why does your sh ship sink and why do you come to those problems in your life when, when, when storms go down? If you remember, I said a lot of it is self-inflicted. Remember? We have these self-inflicted crises. We make bad decisions. We, we, we make decisions based upon circumstances and all those kind of things. And we don't really make the right kind of, of proper decision. And so what ultimately happens is because of our bad decision and our bad planning in life, we end up, you know, on the, the reef that's hidden underneath the surface and we, we, we end up shipwrecked. Uh, I, I want to give you, a, read you an illustration. I'm, Kathy asked me today if I, after hearing this, she said, didn't you show it about 15 years ago? I said, that's infamiliar. I said, listen, this is one of those passage stories you keep in your folder because it makes such a powerful point about self-inflicted problems. And it's basically a, a response to a worker's compensation form where a guy had had an accident on job, and y'all know how that is with OSHA and all these different things, that you had to fill out these following reports when accidents take place and responses when those problems take place. And so he, he comes to a place where he's filling out this reform or continuing to answer questions on the form about a, an accident that took place. And this really happened, this is a true story, and it's written, it starts out as a follow-up to the accident report, as to whom it may concern. 
Dear sirs, I'm writing in response to your request for additional information in block three of the accident report. I put poor planning as the cause of my accident. You asked for a fuller explanation and I trust that the following details will be sufficient. I'm a bricklayer by trade. On the day of the accident, I was working alone on the roof of, the, of a new six-story building. When I completed my work, I found I had some bricks left over, which, when weighed later, were found to be slightly in excess of 500 pounds. Rather than carry the bricks down hand by hand, I decided to lower them in a barrel, you know, uh, by using a pulley, which, which, which was attached to the side of the building on the sixth floor. So, good plan, it sounds like. Securing the rope, the, the rope at the ground level, I went back up on the roof, swung the barrel out, loaded the bricks into it, and I went down and untied the rope, holding it tightly to ensure a slow descent of the bricks. Now, you will also note in block 11 of the accident report that I weigh 135 pounds. I'll let you do the math. <laughs> Due to my surprise at being jerked off the ground so suddenly... I lost my presence of mind. I forgot to let go of the rope. Needless to say, I proceeded at a rapid rate up the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel, which was now proceeding downward at an equal and impressive speed. This explains the fractured skull, the minor abrasions, the broken collarbone, as listed in section three of the accident report form. Slowed only slightly, I continued my rapid ascent, not stopping until the fingers of my right hand were two knuckles deep into that pulley. Fortunately, by the time I regained my presence of mind, I was able to hold tightly to the rope in spite of beginning to experience a great deal of pain. He's six stories up. At approximately the same time, however, the barrel of bricks hit the ground and the bottom fell out of the barrel. Now devoid of the weight of the bricks, that barrel weighed approximately 50 pounds. I refer you again back to my weight in the other block, 11 of 135 pounds. Now, as you can imagine, I began a rapid descent down the side of the six-story building in the vicinity of the third floor again. I met the barrel coming up. This accounts for the two fractured ankle, the broken tooth, and several lacerations of my legs and lower body. Here, my luck began to change slightly. The encounter with the barrel seemed to slow me enough to lessen my injuries when I fell onto the pile of bricks, and fortunately, only three vertebrae in my back were cracked. I'm so sorry to report, however, that as I lay there on that pile of bricks in pain, unable to move, again, I lost my composure and presence of mind. I let go of the rope. <laughs> and I lay there watching that empty barrel begin its journey back down the side of the building, which explains the two broken legs. <laughs> I hope this answers your questions and your inquiries, Mike Hendricks. Poor Mike. How many times have we been in some stupid deal like this? We walked away from that boy, how kind of stupid? That was a dumb thing or that was a dumb decision, or that was a bad idea, or that was a bad comment. Do we have the sermon? Is it not going to work today? Did you not get it? Or you just forget to load it? <laughs> You're working on it. All right. Well, what we're going to talk to do is, we talked before about what to do when you're, you know, why your ship sinks, but today we want to speak more uh, committed on why your ship sinks and why you go through the things that you go through. Uh, uh, we've dealt with. And now we want to deal more like, now that I am in a situation where there's been a failure, how do I handle that? What, what do I do when my ship is sinking? And let me just remind you, first of all, we said that there were, there were five things, and I'm going to list those for you in a moment, that we talked about why we get to that point. Now we're talking about once we've got to that point, how can we redeem this moment? How can we salvage it? Let me just tell you a little bit about the story that takes place in Acts 27 we've been talking about. Remind you, remember, that Paul is on his way to meet with Caesar. He's appealed to Caesar to stand before Caesar in Rome. The Lord has commissioned him. Basically, he goes as a prisoner, to, but the idea is not that he's a prisoner. That was just the means by which he would get to see Caesar and preach the gospel to the greatest, supposedly the greatest man on the planet, the most powerful man as far as men are concerned on the earth at that time, leader of the Roman Empire. A man who himself, in fact, considered himself to be God. All right, so they start on this journey. There's a centurion, don't tell them how many soldiers, how many other people are on this boat. And as we read last week, there's a great deal of difficulty in sailing. They, they keep pry, trying, sailing behind items, try, the islands and trying to stay close to the, to the coast to get where they're going. But still, the prevailing winds are difficult. They're, they're struggling all the way. It's after great labor. They finally reach a, one site where, they, where Paul gets a word from God. And he says, gentlemen, we need to stay in this location. All right. Because if we go further, we, we're going to lose the ship and possibly we'll lose the life of everyone on board. 
But if you remember, they said, no, we don't want to listen to you. We've talked about it. The centurion, the master, the owner of the ship, we've all gotten together and we've decided that you're wrong, we're right, and we're going to sail on. Now, the next morning as they rise, it says, then a soft, cool breeze blew upon them and they thought that they had, you know, that everything was now, the circumstances were perfect for them going farther and pressing on in the journey. But we talked about last week how the devil will blow your cool wind, make you think everything's going all right. They move forward only to find greater problems. And now they get caught in the storm that's called a Eurocladon or Euroquillo, maybe the way it's written in your, in, in your translation of scripture. But it's a massive storm, like we'd be being caught in the middle of a hurricane or a tropical raging storm just off the coast. And they're, they're, it's, it's kind of just sitting in the area. And so they're fighting this for days and days and days. They're, they're, they're fighting for their very life, trying to salvage the ship and save their lives. When it gets down to verse 21, it begins to give a little further description. He says, he says we had gone a long time without food. Then Paul stood up in the midst and said, men, you ought to have followed my advice and not to have set self in Crete and incurred this damage and this loss. Nobody likes to hear that from a preacher. Yet now I urge you to keep up your courage for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship will be lost. And he says, for this very night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve, talking about God, stood before me saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar and behold, God has granted you all those things, all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. We're going to get through this is what he's saying. So be of good cheer. Remember five things that would sink your ship in patience. You know, expert advice. We talked about they reasoned among themselves. The majority rule, they took a vote and said, we're not going to listen to you. We're going to do what we want to do. And the, the idea that stimulated this bad decision was that they didn't want to stay where they were. They were not uncomfortable. At the New American Center, it was not commodious to, to, to harbor there. In other words, you know, no good hotels, no good food. <laughs> we don't want to stay here. And number five was, uh, it looked like everything looked good. Next morning gets up, the wind stopped, things are settling down, let's go. And they make their decision Contrary to what's been told to men to be the word of God, they move accor forward according to a popular opinion and the opinion of all those that are around and they move right into the midst of the storm and it just gets worse and worse and worse. Well, there's five actions as well. There's five things that'll get you in trouble. There's five actions if you find yourself in trouble that you can take. Now, I really believe those first five principles in part one were really powerful and impactful. And those have been five principles that in my life in ministry, I've gone back in the midst of decision, knowing a choice and decision needed to be made about something and kind of weighed everything. Am I making this decision just because I'm impatient or because I want things to change or I don't like what I'm dealing with? Or am I making this decision based on what the experts are so saying instead of what God wants? There's always people to give us opinion. I, I told that the pastor's conference, I said every week, I get probably two, three, ten emails even uh, from different ministry organizations that are out there ministering to churches to tell us how to do it, the best way to do it, the best strategy to take, the best approach to play. Well, that works pretty much in the world, but this isn't a worldly business. The church is the bride of Christ. It's not a business, all right? We're, we're, we're about the will of God and the word of God. So you don't run the church like a business. Now, there are those who are doing that. And perhaps as far as the eye can see externally seem to be doing quite well when they operate. And the head pastor, he's no longer a pastor and a shepherd. He becomes the CEO of the business operation. When you move into that kind of mindset and you consider yourself just a professional instead of a pastor, that's one of the big mistakes you make. We are pastors, not professionals. We're men of God, we're servants of God. As your pastors, as your leaders in this church, we realize that this is, this is a living organism. This is not like a business. It's not about the bottom line. It's not about dollars. It's not about, you know, the, the, I call them the three sanctified bees of, of, of most churches, bodies and buildings and bucks. You gotta have all that, right? That's not what this is all about. This is about following Christ. This is about being, having people who come to hear the word of God and their lives are transformed and they, they become more like Jesus each day in their life. We can do a lot of things to increase the numerics, but that's not what's the issue here. The issue is here, we're seeing people become disciples of Jesus Christ. So we, we realize if we listen to all that and take all this stuff from the emails I get and try to adapt all that because the professionals are doing it, it sounds good, man, you can end up with a lot of problems. 
And there's been times in our lives when all of us have maybe made that mistake of just what's the popular idea and what everybody else is doing and why can't I do what everybody else is doing? And so I think I'll do it because they're doing it. That's a bad place to get to. And we end up in those what I call self-inflicted disasters and self-inflicted storms. I mean, it's bad enough, folks, to remember that, hey, this world is a storm in itself. Even normal life can be chaotic at times. Amen? But then, then there's times of trials and storms and troubles. Some of those we invite, some of those, it may just be God trying to do something deeper in our life. And so he allows those storms. Some of them are self-inflicted, but we just open the door and the devil comes in and brings a storm and starts wrecking our ship. Amen? But whatever it is, these principles here will apply. Just as those kind of obviously give us a clear application of why we get ourselves into those kind of things. I'm going to give you these five things, and I think these will be just as transformative as well as informative, but even more so. When these are applied to your life, these biblical principles that just kind of pop out like golden nuggets in this passage, you listen to this today, and you embrace this teaching today from the Word of God, and you accept what we're teaching here is the Word of God, not, not just sitting there to say, you know, I, I want to hear something. I like to be entertained, have my ears kind of, you know, like, oh, that's interesting, but I really want to hear something from God. I think if you'll listen today with that attitude, I need something from God today, you'll get a hold of some principles like this that'll give you some real direct steps of action because you may well be in a storm, either self-imposed or satanically imposed or God invited, whatever, I don't know. I do know this, in this world, you shall have tribulation, the Bible says, amen? So you may be in the midst of a trial, but remember Jesus said, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world, which is the message which Paul keeps bringing back, right? Be of good cheer, be of good cheer. So here they are, just follow through with me on these. First of all, you need to understand that God's word is true in a storm or out of a storm, all right? What am I saying? God's word is immutable. It doesn't change. It doesn't change based on the generation it's receiving. It doesn't change based on the cultural that, uh, culture that we're in. It doesn't change despite what the world accepts or doesn't accept. I mean, the world may embrace a lot of immorality, which it is in the culture we live. The Bible is still the Bible. God's word is still true. What God said 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, in the beginning of time and eternity, that still stands. It's still true today. God doesn't change his mind. That's what the word immutable means. You know, God is for what he's always been for, and God is against what he's always been against, all right? That's, that's the immutability of God. So we need as Christians to remember that God not changing his mind. Remember this story starts with Paul going to Rome, all right? That's the intent. Yeah, he's been arrested. Yeah, the authorities, but his mind and all this is he's gotten the word from God. I want you to appear before Caesar. You know, if you have to go as a prisoner, we'll do it that way, but I'm going to go, I'm going to appear before Caesar. Now, if you go back to the story before this, in, in the chapter right at, the chapter closes with Paul standing before Festus in the process of getting to Caesar. And Festus is an authority. He's a king. He's in charge. And Festus tells Paul at the end of that chapter, hey, man, I'd let you go free if you hadn't appealed to Caesar. That wasn't inviting to Paul. I'm, not, I'm going to Caesar, you know. Like Festus thought that's going to be a bad thing. Paul thinks it'll be a good thing. God is up to something. If God speaks to your heart about something, hold on. How many times does, does God speak to us about things and, and we just give up or we bail out because we quit believing that what God said before is what God said he'd do after? I mean, I would have resigned here at least 100 times by now. Amen, if I didn't have a word from God. How many times did you bail out of something you didn't have a word from God? But you have a word from God. And no matter what storms come, it doesn't mean that God changed his mind or that God's word is not true. In fact, he says in verse 9, this voyage is going to be in much peril. Guess what? It was in much peril. Just because Paul is on the boat didn't change God's mind. Just because Paul is on the boat and going to Caesar doesn't change God's mind. God says, I'm taking Paul to Rome. You guys are making some bad choices. I'm going to do this anyway. All right. I'm going to get my person where I need them to be. Yeah, that's why Paul, in reflection of his life and all the experience of his life, later said to the church, you know, listen, I can do all things for Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Hey, if God's gave me a word, I'm going to bank on that word. I'm going to do. And then you see Paul operating in this situation in just a, the attitude of praise, not fear. Everybody else is fearful. This is a bad deal. It's a bad storm. You read the whole story later. Please, not while I'm preaching, but read the whole story later. And you'll see these men were living in abject terror and fear of losing their lives. I mean, they're going days without eating. They're doing everything they can to hold the ship together, wrapping it with cables we'll see in a moment. But 
You know, God, God, God said he's going to do something. We serve a supernatural God. It doesn't matter what's happening around us here and now. God's bigger than the storm. So you believe God's word in the storm or out of the storm. Point number two is pretty simple as well. Realize who you belong to. Verse 23 says, For there stood by me this night the angel of God of whose I am and whom I serve. Now, he's not saying he's the, the angels, is, is that's who he's serving. He's talking about the angel of God. It's God whom I serve. It's God whom I, 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 I belong to. We need to remember that in all situations that you are a child of God. That God really does love you. That God really is concerned about you. I know one of the greatest tendencies in the middle of crisis in my life and your life, if you'll be honest about it, is to get a little doubt going in our mind. Oh, God, do you really love me? If I wouldn't go through this, you don't really love me. You know? It's like the old Quaker preacher said, Lord, I'm not as few. I'm not surprised that you have as few friends as you do by the way that you treat the ones you got. <laughs> Amen? I felt that way before. Haven't you, Lord, why are you doing it to me? Why, why? And we get all, you know, in that, that poor me and woe is me mindset. And, hey, we just go back to say, God chose me. God saved me. I, he made a commitment to me to the end. Jesus is God's son and Jesus is the bride of a groom. I just happen to be that groom. And the Bible tells me that Jesus treats the bride perfectly. He sustains, he maintains her, he protects her, he provides for her. He is the perfect husband. And we as his church, as his people, we are the groom and he is committed to us. I belong to him and I am his. He is my father, I'm his child. I'm going to get through this. Why? I know, he said, hey, I believe God. That's who I, who, I, who, he's my God and I serve him. Wouldn't it do well that these times of crisis in your own life, maybe you're in one right, moment, right now in this very moment of your life, to just step back and say, hey, I see everything going around me. The waves of this storm are making me nauseous. I am sick to my stomach. I am holding on with every fiber of my energy every time the wave washes over this ship and it is, looks like it's going under. But hey, God's going to take care of me here. God's going to get me through this. One of the things I preached on, uh, one of the messages at the pastor's conference was the theology or the doctrine concerning the blood of Jesus Christ. And I talked about the blood and its perpetuity, or the way, or, or the way that it's continual, in other words, and, and how that when Jesus Christ died for my sins, he completely died for my sins, for all my sins, for all time. In other words, we know that Jesus covers us from the sins of our past, right? I'm forgiven for everything I did. Hallelujah. I, I, I had a lot to be forgiven. I don't know about you. you. You may have been sitting in church since nursery. I don't know. All right? I had, a, I had a bunch of junk, not only in the trunk. I had it in the engine, the head, everywhere else. All right? <laughs> junk everywhere. He forgave me of that. Now, as I gave my life to Christ, uh, you know, praise God. I remember saying back here, Lord, I give you everything. That night I got saved. Man, I discovered how much I hadn't given him or I've been saved. And he deals with me those issues that may be hindering my relationship and fellowship with him and the blessings of my life, the things that need to come out of my heart and life, things that are obvious, things that David called them presumptuous sins, all right? He deals with me about all that. And what do I do? I get it right with God. I surrender my heart to God. And if I don't, man, I usually end up in a storm until I do get it right with God. But what am I saying? The apostle put it this way. He which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He's going to get you through this. He covered the sins of my past. He covers the sins of my present. You say, what if I sin tomorrow? That's all been paid for. All my sins are paid for. Past, present, future. Why? Because I needed covering from start to finish or I won't make it. Now, I, I need to, that doesn't say I should go out and sin. God forbid, it says in Romans 6. It's because my sins are paid for. But it does mean that, hey, as those things come up in my heart, my life, or as I fail on some level in my life, or I disobey the Lord in some capacity in my life, that means then and there, as the Spirit of God smites my heart with conviction about it, I repent of it, and I get my life right with God. All right? So, but what, what is that teaching us about the covenant and the blood and the power of the blood of Jesus? It's powerful. And God's got me covered from start to finish, so he will finish this. He has begun it. He's going to get me through it. Yesterday, today, and forever, I'm with Jesus. Final departing words of Jesus, Lo, I'm with you. I will be with you until the ends of the earth. Hallelujah. So you need to rejoice in that, that you have the presence of God in your life. 
What does that mean? To me, it means, oh man, sometimes this is hell by the acre. As Bill Stafford says, hell by the inch. But I'm going to get through this. I'm going to make it. You're going to make it. All right. Hallelujah. Y'all rejoice in that. Why am I going to make it? Because I belong to him. And he loves me with an everlasting love. And he cannot fail me because he's promised and been faithful. He's committed himself and his very son to me and well to you as well. So we believe God. How are you going to get through this storm? Maybe even your own failure invited this storm. Hey, I'm going to get back to believing God. I belong to him. I, be- I am his. Now, another thing that we see in the story is about keeping up the necessary disciplines. Listen to what happens in verse 70. Back up what, a little bit for what we read earlier. It says, after we had hoisted it up, talking about anchors, they used supporting cables and undergirding the ship. So they're somehow wrapping cables in the middle of the storm around the ship just to keep it together. And fearing that we might run aground on the shallows of Sirtis, we began down to let a sea anchor, and in this way, letting themselves be driven along. So they're trying to be driven along with less speed, letting out an anchor just for weight purposes to drive along. Verse 18, the next day, as we were being violently storm-tossed, we began to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Since neither sun nor, nor stars appeared for many days, no small storm was assaulting us. From then on, catch this, all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. And when we had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up in their midst and said, men, you ought to have followed my advice. Well, you just want to kill that guy right about now. And not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and this loss. This is a bad situation. And by the way, this isn't Hollywood. This is reality. These are events that took place in time and history. These people are real. The apostle is a real man. He's standing there in the midst of this. You can't even imagine the beating they're taking, the wind, the pervade. I don't know if you've been out in these winds like that. Uh, there's been times I've come up here to the building with, with Phil Dutton and Terry Ackers and others who've come up here. and We'd be standing out there 90 mile an hour winds. You know, I'd stand behind Phil and Terry just not to blow away. <laughs> and I got to thinking, I might not should be here. If they fall on me, I could be killed. <laughs> But out there setting out some stuff to keep the waters from flooding the church. We set out some, some pumps and stuff. And we come up here. You know, that's, I, I can't even imagine days and days of that. And then doing everything you could just to keep everything. But it says that all of a sudden we realize that all hope was gone. There's a lot of people that maybe around you or even this morning, you're in that kind of situation. You just, you just feel all hope is gone. What's the use? You've given up on your marriage. You've given up on your parents. You've given up on your kids. You've given up on your boss. You've given up on yourself. You've given up on God. What's the use? Let me tell you something, especially if you're under the age of 30 today. Because we have so many people in that category, in, in that part of their life where Satan literally drives them to an ultimate death and destruction in their life. Because they get into situations and failures many times are just the trials and struggles of growing up in a very fast-paced, hard world to grow up in. And they feel like, what's the use? And what's the hope? There's no way out of this. Or there's no way I can deal with this. Or there's no way, if I get caught with this, or if somebody finds out, I'd just rather die. And they live with that attitude. What's the use? Listen, the use is that God does love you and God will redeem you and God can redeem your situation and God can do supernatural things in your life. So don't give in to that, that demonic. I, I, I remember reading a book on suicide years ago and, and, and it, the title of the book is called Suicide, an Illicit Lover. And how suicide, you know, comes and romances you and draws you in and you listen more to that spirit of death and that satanic lying spirit, how you're drawn into that and you're lied to and deceived about that. It's a lie. There is hope. When you come to Christ, life is filled with hope. And the power of that hope is demonstrated by God raising his own son from the dead and giving us an everlasting hope in Jesus Christ. It's not all done, but you do need to realize that in the midst of those problems, there are some things that you need to be doing, and that's how spiritual disciplines, prayer, surrender. Now, this is forced prayer and fasting on their part, all right? It says we've been about food for days, all right? But there are times I think that, that we should come to when we're in severe crisis and calamity in our life, it may be well for us to spend a day or two or three in fasting, if not longer. 
to hear what God has to say to us, to make sure we're focused on the right things and headed in the right direction. But we never quit praying. Now, unfortunately, many times when we get in these we get into these pressured situations, there's this despondency that can come up on us and it seems that the last thing we want to do is pray. You ever been there? You just, it just prayer doesn't enter into it. And if we are praying, we're just kind of getting on our knees and criticizing and complaining, but not real prayer. Or that we do realize that prayer is the answer and so we go to the Lord in prayer to seek his face and the devil comes in with these little thoughts and it really is, whether you believe it or not, it's demonic, all right? And if you listen to it, you just open the door for more calamity. He comes in and says, oh, you're just praying because you're in trouble. You ever heard that one? If you weren't in trouble, you wouldn't be doing this. Well, duh. <laughs> what David said, what time I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. How many scriptures talk about the fact when I'm in trouble, I call the Lord. He heard my prayer. When crisis came, I cried out to Christ, I cried out to the Father, cried out, and he heard my, and he delivered me. Listen, when you're in trouble, the best place to run to is your knees and to God. Get with God. Don't, 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 you know, don't listen to Satan's lies. Some of you need prayer today. And what, you know what you've done? You've listened to the devil. You, you listen to him when he says, yeah, I, I need to talk to, to the pastor. I need to have some brothers or maybe my lift leader pray for me or my wife or my husband. I'm really dealing with this issue. And, and all of a sudden he says, oh, you don't want to do that. Because people might think you're not spiritual. <laughs> what a lie. You know, just because I'm going through problems, I'm not spiritual. Because I have a crisis in my, my finances or in my home or in family, I'm not spiritual. Somebody might be failing, that means I'm not spiritual. Don't listen to those lies, you know. That's just pride. All right? It's just pride. Or that one that says, oh, I'm just so humble, I don't want to put, focus any attention on me. That's just pride. It's a different mask. It's a different face, but it's still pride. When I've got some issues coming on, I want you praying for Pastor Joe. Amen? You want me praying for you. We need to be praying for each other. We have this family. We have this fellowship. And I, listen, I think you should know as much time as you've heard me preach, I am not perfect, all right? There is no pedestal for which you to put me upon. Amen? It just doesn't exist because if it does, I'll let you know pretty quick. I mess up a lot. All right, amen. Say it again. We do. All right. We do too. We, we fail at times. We fail each other. We fail in our spouse. We just act ridiculously stupid to each other at times. You know, we get arrogant. We get proud. And it's just, it's just the way the world we live in, this world of tribulation. Pray. But not only that, it says that not only were he said, we began to throw out the cargo, even the ship's tackle. There comes a time you need to get rid of the unnecessary things in your life. The Bible talks about it this way. When, when, when the scriptures tell us in Hebrews 12, we should lay aside every weight of sin that so easily besets us. It's like the, 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 there needs to be a jettison of the cargo of sin in our life. If there are things in our heart and our life that aren't right with God, the best time to get rid of it is in the storm. It is weighing you down. It is going to sink your ship completely. It's going to bring total destruction. You need to get rid of those things that are in your life. Don't ignore them. Don't justify them. Don't excuse them. If you've been mean-spirited to your family or your father, your mother, your husband, your wife, or somebody in the church, you need to get your heart right with God. If they've offended you, you need to go and say, listen, I've I got something going on here. I, I, I just need to be honest with you about, you know, that, that hurt. Or if you've offended them, you need to go and say, hey, I, I was mean-spirited to you. I, I spoke a word out of anger to you. you would you forgive me? All right? I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I don't want that to be my, my life or my, my, my personal record. I, I want to have a heart that's clean with you. Sometimes we need to confess things that, that to the Lord, that, that God has called me to be doing something. And if I'm not doing it, I just need to get honest with God and say, God, I have failed in this. Sometimes it's things I'm doing that I shouldn't be doing. And God speaks to my heart. That's cargo that's got to go. Amen. But the problem is some of you are spiritual hoarders. You got junk everywhere. You got junk in the attic. Amen. You got junk in the closet. You got junk stacked up in the corners. Hey, it's time. Don't even think about a garage sale trading it for some more junk. <laughs> Get rid of it. 
Abandon it. Let it go. It's not bringing you any good. It's not bringing you any victory. It's not bringing you any joy. But I like it so much. You like being miserable? How foolish. The greatest day is when you come to the day of abandonment. That's the greatest day. In, in my life, there's been several, and I shared this with the pastors. I said, there's been several main instances, about two or three I can clearly go back into my life. There were real crisis turning points in my life that if I think if I had made the bad decision and the wrong choice there, I'd have missed God completely on so many other things. Times of brokenness where I really got honest with God. Times when I sat down and let the Holy Spirit just open my heart up and show me all the dirty junk. And just get away from that, that place in my life where it was so burdened down with stuff. Attitudes that were wrong, relationships that weren't right, unforgiveness in my heart, you know, things, things that this way I approach life in itself, the very character of the way I was living my life were just wrong. And I had to get alone with God and say, God, I want you to speak to my heart. I remember one time, even before I had children, Kathy was off at work. I was at the house and working from there. And God, you know, I just, I remember I was just having my quiet time. And I told the Lord, I said, Lord, you know, I don't want to you know, I have been in ministry three or four years. And, you know, I said, Lord, I, I don't want to look down on my life years from now and see that I messed up and just went about this pursuing a career. I, I want to be used by you. Uh, boy, I tell you, that was quite a moment. So I, I hear some of my word. Lord, just show me anything that just would hinder that. I didn't think you are going to show me everything. <laughs> but it was a moment. And I just began to cry. I began to see how, how dirty I really was. You know, just how, how much junk was there that just needed to be dealt with. And I, I, I didn't think I was to do just <laughs> cry before the Lord. I'm not ashamed of that. All right. That was real genuine tears of brokenness and repentance in my life. And it was just like from that moment, I can go back a moment and see so many things that God began to do in my heart and my life from that moment of just transparency. We need to have those occasionally so that revival continues to break out in our heart and life. But if I don't do that and I'm just satisfied with status quo, you know, status quo will sink your ship. It may not happen today and you may be get by with it tomorrow, but sooner or later, those storm winds are going to blow and it's going to start ripping a lot of stuff apart and you're going to miss what God had for you. Don't wait for those days. Keep those things alive in your heart. Lighten the load or go down with the ship. Amen. The fourth is this. You need to continue to believe God's big enough to keep his word. Be of good cheer for I believe God. I believe. That should be your anthem verse in life. I believe. Well, I've got some bad news for you, Pastor. I still believe. I've got some bad news for you, ma'am. I've got some bad news for you, sir. You know, your son is this, your daughter's this, your husband this, your wife's that. This is bad news. No, I believe. You know, I'm not going to let the report of the moment get in the way of God's report. What has God told me about wife, son, daughter, home, church, whatever I'm doing, my career, my, my job, whatever? What, what's God telling me about that? That's the report I'm going to listen to. Satan's never going to give you a good report about anything. And especially when the circumstances are bad, like a storm comes, you start believing the devil's report, then you're going to believe a lie, and then you're going to be in trouble. You have to come back and say, I just believe God. You say, but, but, but you know, when, when God told you this, the circumstances were different. Now things have changed. I believe God. But you have to realize these issues you're facing, they're really impossible situations. Nothing's impossible. I believe God. That's what you hold on to. You say, I have a son. I have a daughter. I've been praying for them and trusting them. They don't, they don't want anything to do with God. They want to reject God. That's okay. They're just, you know, just going to get more spankings for it. But I want you to back up. Has God ever given you a word for their soul and for their life? Yes, he did. He told me, you know, that, that he's going to save them. Just hold on. Believe God. When they come out of this, when they finally wake up, and they finally get their eyes open, redemption and deliverance come, they're going to be mighty for God. It may take a long time, but God's not bound by time. So you quit bound by being bound by time. Hallelujah. Go, that, you praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. Here's what we do. We go to the Lord. Lord, save my son, save my daughter, save my husband, whatever it might be. Yeah, I got this uncle. He's just running for you. God, save my uncle. And the next day we do, well, Lord, God, save us. We do this for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And then we start giving up on doing it. 
Let me tell you a different approach to this. Let's take a faith approach to this. The faith approach to ask God, find a word from God, a word which is simple. It says, God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to, you know, Christ Jesus, all right? Because he loves us. He, and he's, the only reason he hadn't come back is to save all them folks I'm praying for. Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's what that scripture basically said. He's not slack. He's, he, there's still people he's saving and changing lives. So we believe God. For now my prayer begins to change. Lord, you know, I prayed and I asked you to save. And I just want to thank you that you're doing that. I want to thank you that you're working on them. I want to thank you that they're going through the hell they're going through because they're going to find the heaven from you soon. Amen. I want to thank you, Lord. It doesn't look to me with my eyes that anything's going on. In fact, the devil tells me every day, ain't nothing happening here. They're never going to get right. But Lord, I'm not going to believe that report. I'm going to believe you. So I'm going to thank you right now that ultimately you're saving my child, you're saving my husband, whatever. I'm believing you. I believe God. I believe God. I shared with our Magnolia campus the last several years, and we go through stages like this in our life, you know, with Kathy's health and other issues and things that go on and problems that we face in life. Sometimes they just seem to come in big bundles, right? Loss of job and situations change. I mean, all these things, and we, we deal with them. But we've got to stand in the middle of those things and say, you know, it may look really bad now, but I believe God. Amen. I believe God made a promise to me. That, 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 you know, he didn't promise that I wouldn't have the difficulty. He just said he'd make all that work out for my good. Amen. If I believe him and trust him and love him. So you hold on. Don't let go of that. What's he say? Listen, sirs, cheer up. Can you see that? They're holding on for their dear life. They're sick as they can be. Hadn't eaten days, weak and fatigued and mad and sad now and depressed. We're going to lose our lights. There's no hope. And he's walking around saying, hey, praise the Lord. It's going to be okay. Because God gave me a word. It shall be even as it was told to me. What a powerful testimony, amen? And what a powerful word. That's the approach that we take. God, you are big enough to deal with these things no matter what. In fact, you need ultimately not only to remind those with you, but you have to tell the devil every once in a while too. But this is the way Jesus dealt with it, with the devil. It is written. This is what Paul says. It's written. God gave me a word. This is what God said. When the devil came with, to tempt Jesus, it's written. Turn those stones into bread. You're hungry. It's written. That's tempt the Lord your God. Jump off this building. You're not going to be. You'll be all right. It's written. Don't tempt the Lord your God. That's just the way he dealt with it. This is the same pattern which we deal with our issues. I'm going to tell you, Deb, what the, God told me. God told me it's going to be all right. God told me we're going to get through this. God told me, God, you're going to change my, my life, my family, my friends. God, God's got this in control. God's going to take care of this. Let me tell you, in fact, what else the devil told what God told me, devil? God told me, devil, in 1 John, that I'm of God, little ones, so the wicked one cannot touch me. So get off my yard. Get out of my face. In Jesus' name. This is where the apostle, this is a real deal. The last kind of really caps it all is he starts here at this point. What's he doing? He's praising God and he's encouraging them to do the same thing. Twice he tells them in a couple of verses, be of good cheer. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. Be of good cheer. Take courage. Be strong. God's going to get us through this. It's going to happen just like God said. You know what we do? We complain. You know what we do? We criticize. You know what we do? We cry instead of praise God. We bemoan our situation. We tell others about how miserable things are. We tell ourselves how miserable things are. We criticize those who seem to be going through better deals than what we're going through. They just don't understand me. They don't know my deal. They put them down because they're not where we are, experiencing what we are, or they've experienced worse. We just miss it all the way around. And what's exposed here, whether we like it or not, if we're in the middle of our crisis and this is what we're doing, What's exposed here more than anything else is our level of maturity and our character. We're so prone to think, well, I'm such a godly person. I'm such a man of God. I'm such a woman of God. But man, we get in these crises and God kind of lets the mirror flow out and show us where we really, really are. You know? Why could Paul be so courageous and so encouraged and so full of cheer up? Because he's talking to God. He's staying in tune with the Father. And what comes out of his mouth is not criticizing. The only thing that looks slightly negative is when he says, you guys should have listened to me. You should have done what I said to do. But what do we do? We'd rather complain. Let me finalize this this way. One, God gets you where you need to be. 
God's going to get you where you need to be, no matter what it is. Can you just read that for me out loud? God. Now, personally, God's going to get me where I need to be. Amen. What about if I fail? God's going to get me where I need to be. What if everybody around me resisted? God's going to get me where I need to be. What if I'm surrounded by infidels? God's going to get me where I need to be. What if those in authority over me don't believe me? God's going to get me where I need to be. God is bigger than all the surrounding elements. What we need to do is take courage and believe God and verbally confess our victory instead of complaining about our circumstances and see what God does. Would you stand with your heads bowed?